What happened here in the summer of 1940? 5. Perna Sonnenstein. The past is present. Canaletto was, for a time, a painter at the Saxon court in Dresden. The town of Perna on the Elbe River is 11 miles from Dresden. In Canaletto's views of Perna, Sonnenstein Castle can be seen, as it is still seen today, prominent above the town. On the way from the train station to the center of town, I encounter the first of many signs with Canaletto's famous view of Perna. On each sign, words are inscribed. Collective transport, mercy killing, letter of condolence, crematorium, life unworthy of living, racial hygiene, doctors, registration form, disinfected, 13,720, mental hospital. On the walk up the forested hill to the castle, the signs continue. State secret of the Third Reich, special treatment, shower room, bone grinder, urn. In this way, one is led to Fort Sonnenstein, where 13,720 people with disabilities were murdered. On July 8, 1811, Friedrich August I, King of Saxony, decreed the founding of an institution for mentally ill patients, the Royal Saxon Healing and Home Sonnenstein, at the castle and fortress above the town of Perna. From 1855 to 1914, the facility was expanded with many buildings. From 1922 to 1939, the National Nursing College was moved to Sonnenstein. In 1928, Hermann Paul Nietzsche was appointed director of the Sonnenstein Mental Institution, which then had 700 patients. Nietzsche was a strong advocate of eugenics. Under his leadership, questionable medical procedures and food rationing were practiced on the patients. Beginning in 1934, patients from the Sonnenstein Hospital were forcibly sterilized at the municipal hospital in Perna. In autumn 1939, the Psychiatric Institute was closed. It became a military hospital and resettlement camp. Nietzsche became deputy director of the Action T4 Medical Office under Werner Hyde. The front organization was called the Reich Cooperative for State Hospitals and Nursing Homes. Nietzsche was present at the test killing at Brandenburg. In 1941, he succeeded Hyde as head of the T4 Medical Office. In spring 1940, a killing center was established at Sonnenstein. Four buildings were reconstructed on the Elbe side of the grounds. A gas chamber was installed in the basement of House C-16. A crematorium was attached. A high fence was erected to hide what was going on inside. The hundred staff included police who guarded the entrance gate. At the end of June, the killings of Sonnenstein began. The first transport arrived on June 28th. Before being burned, the dead were searched for gold teeth. Remains were ground in a bone mill. Ashes were scattered on the slope to the Elbe. After the official end of T4, in the spring of 1941, Sonnenstein was part of Action 14F13, Concentration camp inmates from Sachsenhausen, Buchenwald, and Auschwitz were gassed at Sonnenstein. During the first months of 1942, extermination camps were established and one-third of the Sonnenstein staff 
were deployed to Belzec, Sobibor, and Treblinka. During the summer of 1942, the gas chamber and crematoria were dismantled. Traces of what took place were removed. From the end of 1942, the facilities were used as the Adolf Hitler School, a Reich Administration School, and as a Wehrmacht military hospital. After the war, the Dresden doctor's trial was held in the summer of 1947. Nietzsche, as well as two of the Sonnenstein nurses, were sentenced to death. Nietzsche was executed by guillotine in March 1948 in Dresden. During this time, Sonnenstein was a refugee camp, a Wehrmacht quarantine camp, part of the district office, and a police school. From 1954 to 1991, much of the grounds were used to manufacture aircraft turbines. In 1977, the Perna Rehabilitation Center was established, which in 1991 became a workshop for disabled people under the auspices of the charity Arbeiter Wolfart. Not until 1989 did what happened at Sonnenstein gain public notice. On September 1, 1989, the 50th anniversary of the official start of Action T4, a small exhibit curated by historian Gatz Ali opened. A citizens-led initiative eventually was able to get a memorial built. In 1995, the basement of House C-16 was reconstructed, and an exhibition in the attic by the Saxon Memorial Foundation was opened in June 2000. In House C-16, there are only traces left of what happened here. Upstairs is the wood-beamed, thatch-ceilinged attic. Here there is a wooden outline of what was the crematorium chimney. All that is left of the chimney is air. On the outer edge of the stairs, from the ground floor to the basement, there are small colored crosses, pink, yellow, white, purple, blue, red, painted, childlike, on the floor. These crosses lead down to where the gas chamber had been. Next to the crosses are numbers, each a remembrance of one of the 13,720 known victims killed here. The basement is rough, unfinished. The floors are brick. If looked at closely, there is a notch in the wall where once the gas chamber door had been hinged. In one room are square black and white photos of some who were killed here. The photos are mounted on top of metal poles. All at an equal height, the faces facing inward are placed in two rows facing each other. From the end of the room, it is as if the parade of the patients to the gas chamber is ghostly, though at a standstill, reenacted. Standing in between the rows in the multi-arched room, it is as if one has entered a silent yet never-ending conversation between those caught between lives both led and lost. Further on, there are bricks behind a plastered wall. This is where the crematorium once stood. There is a vitrine containing small possessions displayed on small multi-level shelves, once belonging to the victims, a comb, a flower-shaped brooch, figurines of a boy and girl in 19th century attire, personal objects found among the ashes strewn on a hill just outside. This display of objects reinstates in small but resonant ways the individuality that photos not always seem able to portray, though we do not know who precisely owned each memento. But what survived the crematorium fire 
was clearly important in some never-to-be-known way to each patient. This is what they took with them when leaving more familiar surroundings to a place unknown. I could only imagine the terror when being undressed of leaving behind in a pocket a treasured, perhaps long-held object that provided untold comfort and unexpressed meaning. Some objects seem utilitarian, like a comb that has been melted, a rusty beige, and could be mistaken for a burnt harmonica. Another seems like a small frame, or is it a pendant with a stick-like figure whose body is Y-shaped with uplifted arms? It could have once been painted. What looks like white and red paint remains in granulated patches in both the figure and the frame. Through one window, I see a memorial consisting of two tall gray stones. Each stone has a carved notch, so the space between becomes an air-filled cross. From other windows, trees from the Elbside slope can be seen. Outside, the Elbside hill is filled with trees, many of which, toward their base, have white rings. Below the white rings, the trees are painted black. This is where the ashes were strewn, in what is now the makeshift cemetery for those killed at Sonnenstein. Taking the other, easier path down to Perna, I follow the crosses, now numbering more than the 13,720 killed during T4. The post-T4 victims killed have been included. At the bottom of the hill, I search for what should be the last cross. I think I find it, but by this time the crosses look more like colored. The last I find are one red, two purple, paint splatter, fainter and fainter bloodstains from a crime committed long ago. Back in the town, I look back up at the fortress on the hill. Though only traces remain at the site, this might be the most evocative of the T4 sites I visited. Facts, though necessary, can be inert if stubborn things, though perhaps not as stubborn as once thought. Near the train station, I once again pass the first sign I saw with the Canaletto painting. Heike Ponvitz called her art intervention for Gagenheit ist Gegenwart. The past is present. Leaving Perna, I know the weight of the evanescent remains at Sonnenstein will take a long time, if ever, to be purged. It is as if I remain suspended amid the unspoken conversation of the faces in the room next to where the Sonnenstein crematorium once blazed.